Welcome back to the Global History Laboratory study circle in Obo, back after the summer break in 2018. And we are three participants discussing two texts today. My name is Holger Weiss. Um, Patrick Hettula. Martin Squazima. Today, and actually, hopefully, for quite many times now, uh, for the next uh, at least sessions of the study circle, we are going to discuss uh, the state of art of global history and where global history is going. In a sense, we are catching up where the rest of uh, similar institutions, platforms, networks, bodies uh, of global history have been uh, for a while now. Uh, in this also, one can say that the whole the discussion, is please, at least in the anglo phone world, was put on the table by Jeremy Edelman in his essay, What is Global History Now?, which was published about one and a half year ago, almost, and created a discussion, especially in uh, the English-speaking global history arena, but about the same time uh, Franz Philofer published in History and Theory in March uh, 2017 his article, A Word Connecting from the Unity of History to Global History. And both of these essays, both of these articles raise the question about, the critical question about what is global history all about? Uh, is global history in a crisis? Uh, has it come to an end? Or is this kind of theoretical perspective on what global history has been and could be a kind of new start um, from a more theoretical point of view, a start for a more critical reflection about doing and writing global history? That will be my introduction to both today's session and the next session where we move to two articles uh, which were published uh, this year. Yes, um, <coughs> I was a little bit surprised by the... Well, first of all, I thought that uh, th these two articles we're discussing today are two very different kind of texts and written in for two very different kind of... Uh, settings or, or publishers because the one on the one hand the the Adelman text is written in a blog and uh, the Philofer is an article then published in history and theory but the the surprise was more the the text by Adelman for me uh, because it really uh, discusses issues in global history that I haven't really uh, seen myself being challenged uh, by global historians. I mean, or that we have, to put it in other words, we have constantly been challenging those issues that he raises as kind of critical issues for global history at the moment. Uh, I think that global historians have continuously tried to uh, see see the connections between these uh, provincial histories and see the connections between different scales of histories and uh, where the, the common theme has been the interconnectedness or the entanglement or these other kind of metaphors that have been used. But then again, the the so 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 the blog text was for me. I I don't I almost dismissed the, the text for being quite naive. But then the, the Philofer text was a uh, more difficult to read, maybe, but it also raises a lot of good critical remarks uh, from the historical perspective of the history of global history and the history of uh, unified history, where he is searching more or less for a definition for what we are actually meaning and writing 
discussing when we're talking about global history, which I think is a valid point and a valid discussion, a discussion of the, the definition. Whereas he is concentrating and focusing more on this kind of the oneness of historical past, of a global historical past, and not he's not uh, arguing as much for the, the the different scale level connect like the micro and, and, and local to the macro and global level uh, connections. Uh, so, uh, and, and and it's a very in intelligent text in its w in its own way. Uh, I I really couldn't argue a lot with his uh, reasoning for how how this unified history has progressed and usually been connected with the world history uh, genre and and many of those historians have then gone into the more catchphrase. Uh, or more or less the global history uh, franchise. Uh, so, so the critique he he gives to a lot of these world, more or less world historians who are then trying to write the the one history of the the globe uh, was quite uh, poignant. Um, but I, I'm I'm. I'm not sure which text should we try to answer or which text mm. should we try more or less discuss. <coughs> but perhaps, yeah. uh, Martin, you yeah. can maybe your, your, your general reflections first. Yeah, I, uh, think, yeah. uh, I think it's quite interesting, as Patrick actually pointed out, with um, uh, with the text from Adelman. And uh, one of the things that strike me is how he talks about the how he conceptualizes world history and global history and and when i read his writing i see i see some sort of uh, kind of like a theoretical epistemological perspective to another form of neocolonialism in writing so to speak that um emphasizes more of a, of of a kind of like an, an Anglophone or Anglocentric approach or hegemony towards the narratives we we produce on 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 what global history actually should represent, and I think it's uh, it's quite interesting from that perspective to to view how his writing <coughs> differentiates from that of um, Philafer from that perspective in the sense that Philafer tends to be more pragmatic in the sense that talks about what global history really should be. In other words, more a more objective kind of discussion. And and while while in my opinion I see I see more of uh, Adelman's focus on on a conception. One of the very interesting terms he brings up is uh, a global Britain which I, I pondered a lot um, on for a long time on, on what it means, you know, the difference between a global world or global Britain. And that gives us a perspective into how he um, perceives what global history is. It's a, more of a, a, a re-emphasis of, of, of a spread of a discourse to, to the other in that perspective. And and I think that's that's quite interesting to to kind of think about and then discuss, uh, especially with what we see now with um, the rise of nationalism in the world with um, mm. the likes of Trumps and and he speaks about Maria Le Pen of France and and all that, as compared to the perspective which Philafer brings to to the table. So I think we if we take it from there, we should have a, an interesting <coughs> discussion. I think generally, for me, I mean, mm. uh, we, we, he, his opening lines, Adelman's in in his essay, mm. what this global history to know when he writes, and I quote here: Historians cheered globalism with work about cosmopolitans and border crossing, but the power plays never went away. Mm. Was for me a kind of sudden critical reflection because I was working on a text on 
global history and, and the question of space and, and, and localization and other mm -hmm. questions. And of course, we have also in this laboratory been struggling with what is the global. I mean, the, the local is, is easy in, in that sense. It's the global. What, what is the global, which kind of started me to check out how has the global been being defined. Mm. And of course, we can go as Filafa is doing and pointing towards the kind of enlightenment attempt to kind of, which ends up in this uni universal idea of uh, a universal history, which comes, of course, very close to this idea that Europe or the Western civilization is on top of everything and so on. But of course, that's, that's the easy story. And for me, Adelman, was quite right when I started to critically reflect on, on what global history, global historians, let's put it this way, which is of course a different thing than global history, but global mm -hmm. historians, and, and it's of course true that Adelman uh, is, for, for me, is more addressing a kind of Anglo-Saxon, especially North American academic world Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we, have, we from the outside, the non-English speaking academic world of global historians mm -hmm. who are doing global history, would like to add, make some remarks about, and the first point was, of course, when he uh, critically reflected upon uh, kind of the realization mm -hmm. of the positive idea of global history enhancing globality or let's say hypermodern globality cosmopolitanism and so on and then the realization is kind of backslash that came with Putin Trump and so on I mean it, what what kind of actually happened on the ground I and mean, that's why he had this start in mm -hmm. the, the place never went away where global historians belonging to this liberal academic world and so on kind of had difficult difficulties of explaining how this could happen, although we always said that global history is now the, 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 the better way or a new way to expli explain the present. Global history, in a sense, we, we gave us the kind of challenge of understanding today's world, but we some, somehow missed it all after 2008, in a sense. That would be my... F reading of one of his critiques and then he kind of now I'm getting to one of his first points is that um, English became globish global history would not be possible without the globalization of the English English language uh, it is one of the paradoxes of global history that the drive to overcome Eurocentrism contributed to the anglicizing of intellectual lives around the world which is certainly true um, but let's say also, our study circle and the laboratory uh, would not be, we would not be, uh, we could not participate in a uh, translocal debate, mm -hmm. if we could put it down, but yes. if you don't use the word global, mm -hmm. but let's in, even kind of, if you only, if you would use our mother tongue, mm -hmm. uh, we would sit in one corner, but we, we could not, it would not be possible for us to interact with others. Yes. So we, we need some kind of language where we can meet, mm -hmm. be it Latin, be it Arabic, be it whatever, and so on. And this is, of course, a question of power. This is a question of Eurocentric past and so on that made English instead of German or mm -hmm. instead of Arabic mm -hmm. or instead of Mandarin Chinese or Chinese or any other language to become the language that is used at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. But of course, we, we do not know what is going to be happen in, within 10 years. Mm -hmm. Let's say uh, the Shanghai list of top universities changes and we have 10 of the world leading universities ending up being the Chinese the one. Shanghai, yeah. Then of course, mm -hmm. one could expect within t 20 years perhaps, Mandarin China, Chinese is going to be mm -hmm. Mm. The lingua franca, because then we have so many who would say that that makes no sense anymore to, to have it in English, but we are focusing, we, it has to be Chinese, or could be. Or then not. Because if, if we, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, that's, that's the, the interesting point when you are doing global history, is that uh, 
usually if it, we want to interact and also if we have but the other kind the, the second part of his argument is that that global history has been focusing on these interactions but kind of maybe not downplaying but almost forgetting the questions of separations the, se the questions of the, the other side of of the story <coughs> but also if they have the other side of the story if you want to communicate with them and also at if you focus on 18th century or 19th century or whatever century and so on, those who are left out in the big story at their time, if they did not do so voluntarily and went into a monastery and so on, uh, would try to communicate. Mm -hmm. And that they would do usually in another language than in their mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And so the question for me com comes that uh, is... Anglicizing, the angli 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 anglicization of intellectual lines around the world. Mm. Is this a problem or not? I would have a remark on, on that, that. Yes, of course, I'm, uh, I agree that that is... And, and from a very pragmatic point of view, that is the, the language of, of communication in the academic world at the moment. At least for us outsiders the there are arenas where you can of course communicate through other uh major languages but still english is the uh as we all know the the lingua franca but uh and now you use a latin word and i, I did <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and and that and that and that takes uh, takes my reasoning to to the point that still when we're using english mm -hmm. Which I don't know how easy it is for for native English speakers to concept that at, we are we are still reasoning in our mother tongue usually we are even if we're using it it's more or less using it for communication than using the language for reasoning uh, that that we are not really uh, like giving up our our stance in our localities, in geographical spaces where we are uh, established, but that, of course, uh, somebody could criticize and say that with the introduction of English, also the the thinking changes uh, and, and the reasoning changes mm -hmm. into these metaphors that are used in the language and, and a lot of these kind of structures uh, umbrella structures uh, mm -hmm. of thinking uh, will mm -hmm. have some kind of an impact. But I'm, I, I, I'd like to think that we as individual researchers with our own background, language, culture, whatever you have, is still uh, is very prominent in, this, in the studies that we're doing mm -hmm. and that, and that we're giving perspective because we are from elsewhere. This is, uh, I have no scientific uh, evidence for this, but I, I hope there's some mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, for me, for me, I think <coughs> uh, I kind of understand his, his, his reasoning in that sense that, uh, as I firstly mentioned, that he kind of like brings the perspective of the discourse of, of um, sort of a neo-colonialist discourse, but this time towards um, the writing of global history, which encapsulates the entire world, so to speak, and 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 reasoning, thinking about global history from that perspective, uh, might on the long run be uh, more of um, a limitation, so to speak, upon how global history should spread. Because most times when I think about probably uh, uh, an academic or, or, or a student in like Papua New Guinea, for example, who, who, doesn't, um, who isn't so fluent in history, uh, in English per se, but then it's really interested in understanding the dynamics and the connections of the world, especially Papua Guinea, as it relates to the global capitalist discourse as history has actually um, exemplified. Um, that could be a uh, double negative in the sense that he he wants to understand the world and his nation from his 
eyes, from his views, but then he has this other notion which comes down, so to speak, from global history, uh, from the way we epistemolide, um, from the, the epistemology we've created for global history upon him. So I try to pragmatically think about that perspective and that kind of hegemony, uh, which I think Adelman emphasizes on. But secondly, if we think about that from that perspective, that um, most times, even though we are translocal, as, as Olga has actually stated, um, our thinking, the way we understand the connections, the scales, the networks, and, how, and these drivers of global history, our thinking still, still um, exemplifies the fact that especially towards global history, that we, we still see how the interconnections and the interrelations between locals and what we call the global actually are shown in our writing. You know? And, and to, to view it from that perspective of language alone might be a limitation, so to speak, in my understanding, because we still have global historians in France. There are still global historians who still write in Spanish and all that. But then to, to be able to create this common understanding about what, it, what, what we're really talking about, um, uh, a perspective from language might be limiting. But that's only if we see that simply from the perspective of language. And if that's what Adelman means, if he's only writing from language, which... I might want to question because I might think Adelman is trying to take us into something larger than simply the Anglophone debate, the Anglophone question, which probably if we read more of him carefully, we might have deeper insights into, into his ideas. For when he talks about the counter-narrative of the likes of Vladimir, Vladimir Putin's fans and the traditionalist worker party in the U.S. Uh, that is the, the, the Putin's fans in the U.S. and how that, how that goes to influence the spread of this Anglophone uh, hegemony in global history, then it means he's talking about something else, which we have to mm. carefully um, reason and, and, and actually highlight. And then from that perspective, think about how it influences or it could mm. influence the future of global history. Mm. Yes, I I also had this kind of sense that the 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 blog, Adamant's critique is also a a uh, critique of the the present or 2017 mm. politics mm. and present state, where <coughs> in a way he sees that the 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 utopia or the the ideology of global history that we all become cosmopolitans, the world becomes a global connected home for us all mm -hmm. and, and these kind of ideal visions because the global histories that have been written are quite often written from a very like, <coughs> positive, uplifting point of view where we are certain that this is uh, for the benefits of the human race that we become more connected mm -hmm. on a global, in a global, uh, on a global scale. Mm -hmm. Whereas... Uh, the critique is is more or less that, that he he is uh, he's seeing the 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 backlash of actually globalization in itself already in the 90s was regarded as self evident that we the the world was becoming increasingly global or the globalization of of markets and different uh, areas whereas global historians uh, could also interpret that this is a quite natural uh, repercussion of this kind of progress into a uh, fashionable global uh, living room where all the politicians mm -hmm. and world leaders get together and, and decide on, on, on mutually beneficial things. Whereas you can see today that the leaders, of course, in a way are challenging this and very, it's a very strategic, uh, a tactic move, because uh, it's it's something that becomes he hegemonic in a way. It's quite easy to challenge with quite basic uh, 
populist uh, mm. rhetoric. Rhetoric, exactly. Whereas, uh, and, and where you can you can you can see this happening all over the uh, the Western world, at mm. least, but mm. also as he, he mentions mm. in India and and elsewhere, where firm leaders are establishing this more. Uh, uh, isolation, mm. isolation uh, policies, mm. and mm. which I, which I think that global historians actually could and perhaps have also uh, foreseen that this could be a a future mm. in in this presence, mm. uh, present day and age. Yes, and okay, mm. I think that. But what is interesting is. Because this is the reason why I put Philofels and, and Adelman stick together is that an Adelman does not address the kind of the this, the first in a sense story of or background or historiography of global history which Philofel is working with mm. the kind of the the attempt to create a master narrative in a sense, <coughs> but what. Adelman criticizes in his essay is this kind of underlying, not very well uh, articulated or critically articulated assumption, or not even assumption, but kind of something way that is there been behind uh, the motives of global historians when they are doing writing global history, mm -hmm. is in fact what Philofer would kind of put into this meta-narrative of the universal whatever mm. explanation uh, and which in a sense the global becomes globality and globalism and whatever and so on mm. because that's the continuation of the enlightenment uh, 18th century narrative minus at least outspoken on, on page one this is not Eurocentric story and blah 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 mm. but then again if you take Philofus kind of critical account in his story and put it together with Adelman's, what we can see is that Adelman is also indirectly criticizing this trend of having global history as a kind of world history, which presents us as an outcome, a worldview, mm. or at least an explanation of where we are here. Mm. And his critique would be, or then we went wrong because we, we, we missed something on the way. And, and his suggestion, apart from the language question, which is, is one thing, and I agree with you, maybe, but I, I think that, that it, it is a case because it had been brought up by non-English speaking global historians uh, many years ago at the global history, European Global History Conference in London. The French uh, global historians were very critical about uh, this already dominance of English language and, and nobody reads uh, French anymore, nobody reads German, nobody reads Spanish, blah, 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 uh, which becomes a problem. But I think his second point, which he has in that we should resignify the place of local attachments and meanings in a, in a sense, of course, catches what the Global History Laboratory of Economy has been trying to, to kind of introduce and work with is uh, and I, I would dare to say, which is also Adelman's kind of opening for what he sees to be the new direction of global history, meaning global histories, uh, moving from the singular to the plural, uh, and moving, getting it down from this kind of universal world scale to locate it much more on the ground, and of course by doing so, ending up uh, having a myriads or any amount of possible kind of parts of explaining what is the global from a local perspective, because if we, we all add up, up these tiny kind of case studies of how the global is articulated on a local scale, mm -hmm then we might end up, by the end of the day, towards something as a kind of new global history. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we are not there. And that, that, that actually is somewhere in the future. Now, of course, mm -hmm. I'm predicting also. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, and, and in a sense, because if, if we read what, what Adelman actually is, I mean, he is director of the Global History Lab at Princeton University, mm -hmm. which is, of course, much more prestigious as Obergrimis. Mm -hmm. 
Global History Laboratory, and where his essay was taken up by uh, the Warwick uh, team on global history, where they came to the same conclusion as was my reading and as I will put forward in, in a forthcoming text. Uh, that, and now I quote from there, uh, Guido van Meersbergens and Julie Met Cruzet's uh, summary of their discussion uh, in Warwick on 8th of November 2017, which is available uh, also on the net, uh, where they had a discussion with their group and for their further di directions based on Adelman's text is that as such the unintended result of the, now quote, the unintended result of the structural adjustments Adelman recommends might actually be another Anglo-centric hegemony that is that in its attempts attempt to be more embracing leaves increasing little room for alternative forms of doing global history. And now that's their point is particularly as practiced outside Anglo-American academia. And they end up, which is also my because I made a mark, mark here, and then in the next section actually they came up with the same conclusion. Its future, meaning future global history, might well lie in the plurality of global histories. So what Eidelmark criticizes is the singular of global history, which in a sense is the same singular that Philippa has now become moved to Philippa's text, mm -hmm. because Philippa comes to the same conclusion, to, in my reading of, but in this third section of Philippa's text, mm -hmm. is that, that it's the plurality, which is both the challenge and the possibility. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I okay. yeah. Okay. yeah, sorry, Martins, you can go first. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to um, point out some some agreement with 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 what Hoga actually has stated now, and the uh, emphasis on global histories. And to understand the power that global history actually has is when we analyze how Adelman understands the development of um, of the criticism of globalism, and he says he says here that global history did not mean the story of everything, but it was more of a, the object of the study of emphasis on connections and skills and 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 integration, and and he points out this fact where the nations were more of the product and less of the producers of global interactions. And that singular point, he states, was one of the um, catalysts to what he called a powerful political movement that arose against globalism. And so that, that actually strikes me in such a way uh, uh, on, on the power of, of how global history is written and how it can spur revolutions in the way, in the way uh, it is perceived, and 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 that as global historians we are much more, you know, like more academics simply writing this narrative, but but by the direction of our writing, we could actually change discourses in the framing of the world. Mm -hmm. And 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 how 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 events actually evolve over time through the way we understand what what global history is compared to how philosophers actually um, his ideas also of the of the plurality and when you think about the future of global history in the sense of of the pluralities which is the same thing I write I talk about also in my articles on. On, um, on, on the possible futures for, like in, in for the post-colony, for example, the possible futures for the post-colony. And, and if probably the future for the post-colony should be an integration of insiderisms, as one writer, uh, I think a Palestinian writer I, I, I highlight, he speaks about this ethnic insiderisms and a study of different diverse ethnic insiderisms as the possible future for the post-colonial theory. And it connects with this because when we think about the, this possible future which Adelman speaks about, the diversity of, uh, of, of, of global histories, then, then, then it forces a redefinition of, of the term global. And then what what then, how then 
could or should we conceptualize global as global historians? Could the global now shift into 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 being really actually what the local actually is, you know, from that perspective. So I think that's where one interesting perspective actually comes for me. Mm. Yes, I, I think that there's a lot of substance in, in, in the in the post discussions of Adaman's text. Uh, and maybe we should give some credit to Adaman that he raises provocative questions mm. that we actually are already in a way here in 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 Obu, we are already trying to uh orientate into this direction mm. whereas still uh, it's we can be critical of this kind of narrative that mm. we are creating as global historians who are trying to find the connections the entanglements the networks the in-betweeners th that f Philifer talks mm. about and and maybe we are creating the narrative and we are creating the global and as uh, he was also mentioning the world makerism by by the global historians uh, and but I would also suggest that a further point is that uh, that, that for global history whether the connectedness and entanglement and all these words have be been buzzwords and been very central to the, to the topic, uh, I also see that the, the, the absence of connectedness, the absence of these networks and, and, and paths and, and avenues and w what you have or don't have between uh, isolated uh, people, histories, mm -hmm. actions, uh, practices, uh, it's also a very interesting and, and valuable concept for global historians to grapple. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also is a critical remark to who is included and who is excluded from this story mm -hmm. of global history or from these narratives of global history. Because Adamant criticizes that the, the, the Anglo-centric and the, the, the discussions he has been part of have... Uh, not really bridge the the gap to those people who are in the dark still who haven't mm. been able uh through through language or mm -hmm. or resources or what whatever mm. to really be a part of this discussion mm. which is a very very uh small academic mm. discussion mm. still um uh, but but yeah, whereas I see that the, these kind of issues that there aren't really, uh, en from an enlightenment perspective, really uh, attractive to global historians, have also then been many times the focus of global histories, the the issues of uh, disasters and crises, mm -hmm. and and kind of these histories that have have emerged from being cut off and is isolation uh, situations mm -hmm. and settings. Mm -hmm. And from this point of view, I think it's, it's, it could, like, we could also view the, the backlash as a, 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 a typical event of a more global, more networked mm -hmm. glo uh, environment where there are these kind of I would say the quite, quite typical backlashes of, of those mm -hmm. who are, it's a question of power then, who are trying to uh, re-empower themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, through this kind of action, through this action of, of resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, you have a very interesting point, especially from the perspective when it comes to power. And, and, and when I read the philosopher, on, on the page 30 of his article, something strikes me in the sense uh, uh, on how we, uh, the, the epistemology that has actually um, guarded global history in the sense of the same buzzwords you talk about, inter integration, interconnectedness and all that, in the sense that global history has almost been an initiative to include to include 
you know, um, it, it has actually had this mission of inclusiveness. Like a philanthropic Yes, mission. sort of. While Philofer here on this page 30 is speaking about a way of writing global history to emphasize resistance, in the sense that from that perspective, I'm, now I'm just th thinking over my head, but I'm, I'm thinking of a, posit a possible future for global history, in the sense that the histories that write about resistance to philanthropy, so to speak. And I think that's what he's highlighting here, that was an alternative trajectory to this co-production and co-emergence into one narrative. And then a way of viewing global history as not emphasizing inclusiveness, but resistance. In the sense, it will still be talking about a, a global story, but the, the essence of the story will be more of resistance to something. In other, in other words, spread a narrative from that perspective. So it could be a way to counteract the, what Adelman thinks was a reason behind the protest as, against globalism in writing global history, in the sense that probably it could satisfy some of the fans of, of this you know, notion of, of not really wanting this inclusiveness, so to speak, but in the same time, they would be writing global history, but not a history of inclusiveness, like you said, philanthropy, but a history of, you know, like he says. And the attractiveness of particularity. Yes. Also. That point. Yeah, in a sense, it will still be global history, but I mean, <laughs> it might be a little bit more tricky in a way. But mm. I think it's it's interesting now we have moved to Philofer's text mm. and, and kind of as a comment to mm. to Adelman, uh, where when I've been, and of course this is unfair to you because mm. I'm now referring to text which we are not <laughs> discussing here. Uh, one of Jürgen Osterhammer's uh, well, his last book. Uh, to influence the Adler, this Adler, uh, we has an essay on uh, globalizations and, and underlining uh, instead of speaking of globalization in singular, speaking of globalizations in plural, and so on, which is of course based on, on an early essay, which mm -hmm. Philip also refers to in, in, in his his essay, uh, and, and another discussion by Matthias Middel in in, in Leipzig about uh, globalization projects. Again, mm -hmm. the the plural form, uh, and in a sense, when Middel uh, and his uh, team in Leipzig are trying to take down the, the the whole discussion from the global, it's still about the global or globals in in plural in a sense, mm -hmm. but uh, are trying to to get it down, be it uh, which uh, with what he with Katja Naumann discussed in. Uh, by using the concept portals of globalization, and we can really get it down to, to a portal, or, and we could argue here we can, we can identify processes of globalization or gl processes of globalizations also in a, let's say, slave plantation or any, anywhere. I mean, when we really start to dig and start to locate it and, and then open up these particular locations, and uh, first from a, from a theoretical standpoint, if we realize, or not to realize, but if we are uh, confident with the idea that this location is in itself an amalgamation of as many possible worlds that can be present at that mm. uh, very location, then of course it becomes interesting for us to open up these different worlds, th this, these different connections which might only point to the next neighbor, but always maybe to oneself, but then also maybe to the next location, and then to the next region, to the next continent, and so on, and we don't move anywhere. And of course, the, the best example, which I, when I was looking at a TV program, document TV program a couple of nights ago, uh, about uh, Vermeer's paintings, where Vermeer, mm -hmm. this Baroque uh, 17th century mm -hmm. uh, Dutch painter, mm -hmm. it actually is only in a room, but through painting and kind of the image that he creates in this room is you have already the whole world present in that room. That's what we do when we kind of are trying to localize the global. Because we, we open up the global, 
and of course, then then we also start to define what is the globe. And, and, and I guess that we could even have have at one location, or at, or at a certain place. And now I use not necessarily interchangeable location and place. Uh, many words, and we can read many globals mm. or globalities mm -hmm. into that mm -hmm. being present at that very moment in a certain certain place. Mm. But of course. That's from, from a theoretical kind of uh, thinking, uh, but we have been trying to, to do so in, in the Global History Laboratory here at Ovokademi, is that, that, that the, 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 it, and uh, as, as I, I noted in, in the starting of this discussion, was that the, the really kind of, the problem is the global. That's, that's what, what is the global, what constitutes the global? How, how, sh how shall we define it? And, and we cannot do it in, in the old way, in, in just writing, now, now we're doing global history, because that's, that's the problem. What is the global in global history? And so we have to take it down somewhere, or we take it up to the next dimension, to the fourth dimension, <laughs> in a sense, and look look it from, let's say, Mars. But that we do in, in the next life, whatever. So, so, so and that, that's why I kind of, uh, I think, found it very stimulating of going from Adelman to Philafer and, and have this kind of critical discussion about how we ended up with this kind of worldview, universalistic worldview, uh, which still is there and which still kind of makes it so problematic for us to, to uh, disengage, I would take one step back from what, what we kind of speak about global history or the global, we, we, we are mm. teased to mm. be the continuation of this 18th, 19th century project. Mm. Mm. Yes. I think that this is a discussion that we continue on Wednesday, but uh, mm. just a, a final remark is that we really didn't uh, discuss the, the specialization of global history as much as uh, maybe Philofer was referring also to, w where we are working uh, with different scales. But maybe this is something that we can return to in our next yeah. podcast episode. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.